So, Andre, your 10 minutes. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I mean, just to make it, you know, I, I don't have a disclaimer and I, I'm trying something new, not having slides. But uh, my background actually, it's a, you know, it's, it's a little bit different. I'm, I'm new at think tank uh, territory. My, my background is electric power. I spent 20 years in the Canadian power system in Ontario Hydro. And I, I used to run the International Emission Trading Association that David is, is a CEO now, a, a chair now. So uh, it's a very, very heavy corporate, I have to say that. However, it's good now to be able to write about things without having to worry about reaching consensus in the business community and, and having to, you know, before you get up and say something, everybody knows what you're going to say. So, uh, so I'm, I'm free as a bird, as they say. But... Uh, yeah, we, you know, we, we actually had a session yesterday in, at, at SEPS looking at the 2030 paper and, and one, we had a guest from, from Ireland chairing that meeting, Frank Connery chaired that, that meeting for, for us at SEPS, so we had a quite, quite an interesting discussion and, and Frank actually managed to extract a lot of wisdom, of this was very, very useful. But coming back, we also, or I also went through the, uh, trying to understand as to what had worked and what hadn't worked. In, uh, in the EU climate and energy policy. And uh, the ETS, in, 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 in my mind, and I don't disagree with David, has worked and is still working. And when you say worked, I, I look at it from the point of view of, uh, of good market work uh, functioning. And good market functioning has a very, very clear definition or, or somewhat clear definition in terms of tight spreads and liquidity. And, and transparency and, and the ability to get in and out of the market, et cetera, et cetera. This has happened. There's no doubt about it. Even in the worst moments of the ETS, this has happened. But the worst moments have really not been very long. They've been at the end of period one, and then we, we, but we knew we were getting into period two. However, I don't know that this is going to be the case for much longer. I think that what we, you know, kind of moving from one period to the other and not having banking has been masked by, uh, uh, by this, this, this jumping between phases. Because what we see now, we see variability in, in prices of 10% a day, I think about four or five times over the last three weeks. 10% a day, if you have 1,300 on the Dow in one day, somebody's gonna jump out the window. And yet we are taking this in stride and we think it's normal, but I don't call this good market functioning uh, and the kind of thing that you wanna see in the market that drives your economy. The second thing that I would also say that we've seen reduction, quite clearly we've seen reduction, but we don't really understand why we assume that most of them have happened because of the economic crisis. And at this point, we start getting some sympathy for the Eastern Europeans. You know, remember some of you who, who, who follow the uh, international negotiation, they've been blighted by this term hot air, which is very pejorative in my mind because being paid with a lot of hot uh, social misery in Eastern Europe, and they, you know, they don't forget that, they said we paid for it. But now we have Western European hot air in the ETS. So we don't really know what the amount is due to reduction, what the amount is due to, uh, to the impact of the ETS, that probably not much due to the result of the ETS. The renewable has been successful beyond what we thought it would be. Energy efficiency has been but much less so. Uh, we have seen uh, the international impact of the EU climate change policy, a reflection to some degree of the domestic policy as being somewhat successful and somewhat less so. We've seen a kind of the impact of, of, on the CDM and driving a price of, of carbon internationally and that becoming known as a cultural change, an enormous success, way beyond pe what people understand. But at the same time, the, the success of the EU in driving international climate change policy has also been to some degree mixed, in my own opinion. Uh, you know, Copenhagen hasn't been this, this roaring success, and I think we've made some, some progress since, and, and the EU has managed to move the agenda in the international negotiation. Uh, but what is also important, the energy investment really has not been very successful because we're seeing energy investment going in the wrong places the only one that I think we're seeing that's successful is that that was subsidized. The only, you know, we, we see coal-fired generation and the only, the only generation that is renewable is because they're substituting and feed, feed in tariffs, but otherwise I don't think that it would be there. Uh, so now what do we, you know, what, having reflected on, on kind of this, what are some of the lessons learned of uh, 
of what we have seen because you know you have to learn from the past in order to be able to move successfully in the future. Uh, first of all, we need to understand that we are in the middle of a, of a transformational period. This is not a normal period and climate change is not, not a normal and not an easy topic. There are two international dimension things that are not working very well or we have not made success. One of them is the UNFCCC negotiation and the other one is Doha round of, of trade. And the reason for that is that both, they are both trade agreements essentially. So let's, let's not forget that and not, not forget that we are trying to negotiate or trying to do in Europe about four or five different things at the same time. So a whole bunch of people are being agitated about backloading. Um, same people are talking about structural reform in the ETS, same, roughly the same bunch of people talking about post-2020 or 2030 climate energy policy and, and somewhat different people talking about the 2015 international agreement. Timelines are different. The issues are not necessarily different, are interrelated. All that in the, major, in the middle of a major international realignment with, with all the bricks becoming, or the basics now becoming a very different economy that we used to have. So the fact that we're not reaching conclusion doesn't necessarily that we're stupid or we're not trying, but the reality is this, are, this is a very complex and very kind of watershed moment. Now, what are the interaction? Because I've been asked to talk about the interaction as best as I can. And I think that the interaction, there's a number of interaction identified. One of them is the interaction with the ener between energy and climate change policy, the interaction with the international dimension, and international, the interaction with competitiveness and leakage. And uh, these are the three ones that, that I, I found. Uh, what was discovered during the, uh, in, in relation to these interactions up to now on the 2020 uh, 20 package? One of them is the, the fact of uh, uh, the lack of flexibility. Uh, and we, you know, in the business community, and I've been, you know, part of it in, until about a year and a half ago, had been asking about flexibility and predictability. And, and that is, you know, kind of, we, we, you know, this is something, a new phenomenon, because for the longest time, we've, people have been asking to be, to have certainty. There's no certainty in business. There, there's some, you know, kind of predictability of how you act. But the predictability that's been asked now has become rigidity. And the rigidity is transformed, there is, especially in the UETS, which is the centerpiece of this whole thing, basically has become so rigid that it cannot respond to market forces. The changes are driven in the market, but the time frames and the mechanism for, for, for adopting those changes are in the legislative arena. And the legislative arena in the US, I'm in the EU, I'm being Canadian, it's a little bit, much, a little bit simpler in Canada, even though we have provinces and so on. But this is by a factor of, by a factor of incomprehensible. It took me a long time to even begin to understand how this thing worked. So we, essentially, we, we, we needed to understand what the coordination was between the various pieces. What we have, we have three targets. There has been some thought being given at the beginning as when, when those targets were set as to what the impact would be, but nobody really thought to put in place a mechanism how to adapt if there were changes. You know, we have an abysmal way of predicting the future, especially the economic future. And as such, we predicted in 2008 what the economic future is gonna be up to 2020 and establish targets based on that, and no mechanisms to adapt to that. That is a little bit rich. Frankly, I mean, not surprising that it doesn't work. So if you wanna have, either you have one target, which is the greenhouse gases, because this is, you know, you wanna have an environmental target, or you have three targets, because you have other objectives. But the other objectives have really have to be explained and specified very, very clearly. If you have three targets, you have to have coordination between these three. You have to have, a, especially if you want this to be technology neutral. Now, if you don't want it to be technology neutral, you, have, you want to do certain things, then, I mean, let's kill something and let's not fool ourselves. It costs money to run an emission trading system. It costs money to have people running and trade. You know, we built, the last 10 years, we built trade desk and expertise. And by the way, every day I see friends of mine that have been driven out of this greenhouse gas market because there's nothing to do. Are these guys gonna come back? Is the same talent gonna come back? The answer is no. So unless we pre provide a flexibility in this market, I think we need to, uh, this is not gonna work. The second thing is the flexibility to responding 
to the uh, variation in what we predict in the renewable. For instance, we expect the renewable will have certain impacts. But the impact on, on the carbon reduction has been much, much larger. How do we adapt to this? So we have a piece of adapting to what the economic condition is, and there needs to be some flexibility mechanism business there. But at the same time, we, we will have a, a, predict, a, a forecast of what the impact of, of renewables is going to be on carbon. David has just had all these very nice graphs explaining what happens. But if you don't have something that kind of looks, OK, we predicted so much, but actually there's so, so much more. And as such, we got to take stuff off the market because otherwise you shadow the price of carbon, and carbon becomes irrelevant. It not only becomes irrelevant, but it's a lose-lose proposition because it's irrelevant, but you pay for it. Because it is in the cost of electricity, but you, it has no impact. So it, it, why, why do we do this? It's, you know, I, I remember, I, frankly, I remember talking to Stéphane Dion, who was the minister president of COP in Canada, and basically Stéphane said to me, Monsieur Marcou, with his you know, incomparable French accent, is, look, this emission trading system, you know, the industry doesn't support it, the NGOs don't support it, why should I do it? I'm a politician. So if, if, it, has no price, if it has no impact on reduction, it has no impact on reduction, but it costs the Greeks and the, and, and, and the Spanish at 27% unemployment, why do it unless you can actually make it the instrument that is effective and drives something? And yes, we do understand that it drives certain elements of the economy. It doesn't drive the basic R&D. It does not be, drive the basic R&D. It drives implementation. But so do feed-in tariffs. Feed-in tariffs do not drive R&D. Feed-in tariffs drive implementation. So it's a competing instrument. And finally, the, there is an interaction with the international dimension. And that interaction also has to be taken into account because we have done better than we thought and we have catalyzed all the Bolivians and the Peruvians and the South Africans to produce stuff. And now we find the situation, so you guys are too good at this, you're producing too, much, too many credits, including your own, your own people here in Ireland at the uh, Electricity Supply Board, but we don't want it. It, 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 it's really creating a serious problem, and unless we manage to have a mechanism to deal with this, it's going to be a problem. The other thing that I think is learned is this, this job thing, this green job things that, you know, on my own SEPS organization, I have a whole bunch of people having grants and doing research, and it, it's great. But the fact of the matter is what? Yes, we catalyze green jobs. Yes, we catalyze all this wind energy. But it's not, it's not here. It's all in China. We, we did the research. We, we produced everything, and then the Chinese are, are producing it at prices that we cannot compete with, and then we're installing it here. So if we are to have this as a target for green jobs, this has got to be thought around as to what else needs to be done in order for to have this job being retained in Europe, or else we're going we're gonna to subsidize somebody else's research and, 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 and so on. Because once the basic research is done in many of these things, it's not necessarily very complicated. I don't know much. I've never made a, a turbine in my life. But I understand it's not that complex to, to make a turbine. Is it uh, bang, bang? OK. In terms of infrastructure, the, the, the next thing is infrastructure. Really, we have implemented all these renewables, which is great. But we cannot get them out of Spain, and we cannot them get it out of the north of Germany, because the infrastructure is not there. And unless we do this, there's no point in doing I, I'm an electrician. I, I don't understand too many things. I understand two things. One of them is football and that Barcelona lost, which hurt me. <laughs> the other one is I, I understand the electricity because we had the same problem in Ontario. In, 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 in Quebec, we had a lot of generation of north hydroelectric, and we had no ways to get them down there. Same situation here, not very different. And finally, last but not least, and right now, I do not believe with all due respect to my friends in industry, that leakage is a problem. At three euros a ton, it cannot be a problem. I can tell you that at $15 a ton in Canada, the price, the impact on the price of barrel is 25 cents. So if that is the case, I'm not sure what your calculations are, but that's what I'm being told. So at three euros a ton, it's not. But if you really are to drive this and you have 25, 30, 35 euros a ton, then it becomes a problem. It becomes a problem twice that is not being addressed quite well. One of them is an internal problem, because the way it's treated right now is only certain bunch of certain member states that can do the subsidy because they have the money, but most, most people don't. The, the Italians and the Greeks and the Spanish can't do it, but the Germans can. And then you have the real elephant in the room. The real elephant in the room is the international dimension. 
because we're going to get to a 2015 agreement and we're linking with Australia. And this is going to be a competitive issue because we don't really understand how to do this. I'm happy to, to elaborate. Thank you very much.